You just have the shittiest timing, don't you? By the way, as a quick side note, I took down the Daitomodachi video because I can see he's making a sincere effort to improve his style, so... You know, it doesn't apply anymore. And as an additional disclaimer, this video isn't a claim to objective quality. I'm not one to assume the ideas or premises I make are of any decent standard since I'm deathly afraid of appearing narcissistic, but I do feel the need to explain that although I can't claim my work to be objectively good, I do believe that the ideas I present here are at least better than those found in Ruby, six seasons in all. Ruby is one of the most tragic animated series of all time. It's a nightmare and the product of a long dead visionary who, in all fairness, was probably led astray from the start. He obviously made the red trailer to pitch the series and Rooster Teeth just decided to rip off Soul Eater for the rest. Seriously, think about it. The lack of focus and planning in the show is so obvious even before Monty passed away. Even though I can't help but feel like they don't even know where they are, creating lore as often as they are abandoning it, it's so aimless and desperate. The fuck does Dust do anymore? Was it even important to begin with? It's one of the first things we learn in the entire fucking series and they just drop it. Anyways, right over. I feel like I can do a better job at constructing a world than Ruby at least, so today I'm gonna pitch you my alternate version of the world. I'll talk about the geopolitical world, the nature of the Grim, resources, basic history, character descriptions, and a brief summary of what I would want to see if we're adapted into a full series. If you feel like I'm wrong for simply assuming I can do a better job than Ruby, then Whatever. There's no way in hell you can defend this shit anymore. It sucks. Fucking drop it. And by chance, if Rooster Teeth is watching this, please stop. So here's a brief summary of what we're gonna do to the world of Ruby. What do we want? Conflict. Where do we want it? Every Remnant is the literal remnant of a long-forgotten age, the Imperial Age, where airships and silver cities ran the Earth entire. Technologies and innovations from that time still endure, with ballistic weaponry, holograms, flight, and the exploitations of dust as a power source. Apart from this, only a few monuments have survived the generations of war and feuding nation-states, much like the legacy of Rome. Many of the technologies passed down from the Imperial Age are either repurposed for warfare or mistreated altogether. Case in point, androids. The actual histories of this era have since been lost, but what these feuding countries do know is what caused its downfall. Traditionally, the realm is known as Teria, which is a supercontinent spanning a significant portion of the planet, but now it's more commonly known as Remnant, as dubbed by generations of scholars studying the Old Empire. The name refers to a cataclysmic event known as the Fall, a worldwide disaster that racked the planet and split the moon, creating anarchy and panic within the Empire and eventually leading to its downfall. The specific details are unknown since it's been so long ago and the technologies needed to excavate more information have long since deteriorated or been repurposed. Teria is split into two spheres, East and West. The West has been lost for centuries to hordes of demonic creatures known as the Grim, which mysteriously appeared across Teria after the collapse of the Old Empire. Alongside them spread an incurable disease that dramatically altered the physiology of humans, creating a second genotype of humanoid sentient life known colloquially as the Faunus. More on these two later. Humanity, and by extension their kingdom slash nations, exists solely in the eastern grasslands of Marathon. Everything west of their dominion is the frontier, a dangerous world filled with jungles, deserts, swamps, steep valleys and treacherous mountain ranges. These are the mystic lands of the Grim, and very few people have ever been there. Even fewer have returned. There are a plethora of human kingdoms in Marathon, but the most notable ones are Torinth, Baradina San, the Boro Principalities, the Kingdom of Gailus, the People's Republic of Mistral, the Free Banks, Calabrir, and Atlas. Side note, Vakuo is a fucking stupid name, and Vale sounds way too close to the Vale of Erin. Sorry. Also, when I mean human kingdoms, I mean all of humankind, including the Faunus. The Faunus themselves don't own any sovereign piece of land in Terria, other than the fringe groups found in the frontier, and those don't last very long. Of these nations, Torinth is by far the most militarized, with extreme similarities to Victorian Prussia. The recent Torian annexation of the city state Aurora sets the stage for Gira Kali and Blake's characters, once again, more on that later. Baradina San is a southern Imaret king Kingdom that resides in the borders of a large desert. The principalities are a loose federation of city-states to which Aurora belonged. Mistral is a proto-communist state where humans and faunus live equally and get the same paychecks but are confined to a strict caste system. And the Free Banks are another confederation of merchant city-states that inhabit the wealthiest region of the eastern shores, the Golden Delta. The rest are basic kingdoms with your standard monarchs, each with varying degrees of authority. In Gaelus, the monarch is largely ceremonial, while in Atlas, 
the monarch is the state. Of course, that doesn't mean the kings of Gaelus sit idly by in times of draconian legislature, so ceremonial might be too lenient a description. Anyways, regardless of what kingdom they are, the ruling class of the Eastern Shores long for a time of unity against the Dark West, a second empire in wake of the first's collapse. Naturally, this collective longing fuels generations of warfare against feuding houses and rival governments, preventing that very unity. Lastly, I'd like to come back west. The Grimm are not sedentary. They are restless and want nothing more than to kill humans because eating shadows in caves isn't very filling. To combat this, the countries of the east have gradually built up a defensive line against the hordes, pushing the frontier further and further west with each passing generation. This line is often marked with contiguous walls that are gutted as the defense presses on, only to be rebuilt at the front lines. I bring this up because on a geopolitical scale, this is often seen as the edge of civilization, as far as the human kingdoms are concerned, and everything past it is a barren wilderness. Comparisons can be made to Hadrian's Wall, Constantinople, or this tiny ditch on the edge of the wilderness in RuneScape. Oh, and I guess also the Great Fucking Wall of China. The Geth are a ne <laughs> The Grimm are demons that wander the Dark West. The word Grimm is a colloquialism of the imperial words Gri and Ermir, which roughly translate to shapeless devils. Unlike the Grimm and Ruby former, these Grimm have a much larger variety of forms. Think of them more like SCPs than black creatures with theater masks. And also, side note, this is literally Shadow the Hedgehog. <laughs> Some take on the shape of an animal, some imitate inanimate objects like rocks or sand, and some can even take on the form of spacious gas, analogous to darkness, shadow, and pestilence. The deeper travelers wander into the west, the more dangerous the Grimm appear. Grimm are extremely dangerous creatures. They cannot be bargained with, and they cannot be controlled. They are, as Sovereign would have put it, each a nation unto themselves, and will try everything they can to kill. They do not abide by the balance of nature, and as such, they pose an existential threat to both humankind and Terria. If they cannot find humans or animals to feed on, Grimm are known to literally absorb darkness, and tend to do so in dark caves that span the entire continent. Side note number three, non-hunters avoid caves like crazy for this very reason, and ore mines have since been converted to open pits, which is why Ketabrir has entire hillsides covered in big holes. Grimm are almost always found past the frontier line, but sometimes lingering spirits wander the dark places of the east. There's no real guarantee that a Grimm isn't waiting in the shadows. Because of this, hunters see plenty of action on both sides of the line, so to speak. Hunters, conversely, are an elite force of warriors that train to fight Grimm and protect the dominion of man. Ironically, they are often contracted by the ruling class to do more than just fight the shapeless devils. In times of war, hunters are sometimes brought onto the battlefield to fight the country's enemies, and otherwise they can be hired as bodyguards for nobility. Either way, they are a force to be reckoned with, and becoming one is seen by many as a means of social mobility, a la samurai or knights. Some hunters fight exclusively on the frontier, and vice versa. Hunters equipped a variety of weapons depending on their fighting style. These armaments tend to rely on Imperial tech quite a bit, so the heavier duty weapons use dust as their main source of ammunition and power. Without going into too much detail, the smithies of the free banks are masters of lightweight weaponry, so the more ambitious hunters love to commission obtuse, complex, and large weapons for their arsenal. Example, Crescent Rose. These weapons range from small firearms and martial augmenters to longswords and gallant scythes, with colorful and distinct designs that help hunters stand out among the crowd. They can also kill things, I guess. Hunter societies and monasteries congregate at the edge of the frontier. Each hunter society has their own code of law. Some are lenient and some are strict. Ultimately, they are all unique with their own dress codes, disciplines, code of law, code of honor, prerequisites, exams, and so on. The more lenient ones are much more like academies and school, while the more strict ones function exclusively as monasteries with ranks analogous to actual churches and inquisitions. Case in point, the Church of Beacon, which was started by a group of four hunters, including the mother of Ruby Rose. Beacon Beacon does not admit Faunus, and many of its students look down on other hunter societies for allowing them in their ranks. Relatively speaking, the Order takes a very absolutist stance against Grimm and the mutations that humans underwent in the fall, the result being the Faunus. Their beliefs elevate humans as a master race among lesser subhuman beings. That's not to say everyone in the Order has this stance, but they are expected to represent it in their dealings with other societies nonetheless. Like Beacon, these hunter groups are entitled to their own beliefs, and many of them stem from actual religions found in Marathon. Haven's Light is another such society. Not all societies are religious, however. 
Before enlisting to go on expeditions, hunters are trained extensively at their respective societies, learning how to fight the Grimm as best they can. If they are deemed unworthy or inept by their peers at the end of their education, those hunters will not receive the necessary identification to travel west until they really earn them. These papers vary with each society. Beacon uses the standardized hunter's license, while a school such as the Torrent-funded Imperia Academy likes to just hand students a bunch of papers when they graduate. Bureaucracy. If you didn't already guess, being a hunter is extremely lucrative. You can make mad bank as one, with the trade-off that most missions you're assigned to are almost always treacherous. Obviously, the choice of what they apply their skills to is up to the hunter themselves. They can fight on the frontier, they can enlist as officers and armies, they can do both. It's entirely up to them. In the case of societies like Imperio, where they're funded almost exclusively by the Torian government, students are taught to fight for their country both at home and abroad. Joining an army or group opposed to Torrent is considered treason. So there are ideological barriers to what you can and can't do, but being a hunter is profitable nonetheless. Hunters are also regularly contracted to venture deep into the wilds for coin and country, finding artifacts and resources that are otherwise non-existent in the east. There's no shortage of dust in Marathon, but more unstable compounds can be discovered in ancient ruins from time to time. Oh, and also there's ancient ruins for the Empire. Oops. These jobs vary widely from escorts and fetch quests to full-on sieges of dead cities. Either way, the frontiers pushed farther and farther west with each operation. It goes without saying that dust is an important asset in the post-imperial age. Combusting the ethereal power with a matchlock of flint and steel creates an extraordinary burst of electricity. Channeled through conductor wires, the resulting power is used to fuel massive machines, engines, matrices, and emeralds across Terria. I'm not a schooler, so don't ask me about how the dust itself works. In Ruby Former, it's apparently some kind of mystic propellant that activates because of people's aura or soul or whatever, and it's basically just the big magic resource MacGuffin that reappears when it needs to. You know, the laziest trope in fiction, which has absolutely nothing to do with a certain powder-esque compound found on a desert planet in one of the most successful and well-known science fiction books of all time. You get it. I'm reluctant to reintegrate dust into Ruby since it really is just the magic MacGuffin resource, so then how about this? People think first and foremost of electricity or power as the big modern innovation, the internal combustion engine. Dust is just the fuel, like coal or water or steam. It's a lot more efficient than either of those three at creating power, but it's merely a means to creating power nonetheless. It's valuable, but only in bulk. The more unstable compounds exist in smaller quantities and are typically found in the undeveloped west. The more unstable the dust, the greater the power it generates. Thusly, unstable dust in the west is extremely valuable for hunters, corporations, and the ruling class, while eastern dust is more seen as fuel than a resource. Problem solved. And to cover our tracks, let's just say that things like steam power and internal combustion engines exist as well. Let's just imagine that the old ways of the empire, running everything with dust, exist alongside the separate innovations of humankind today. That way, dust is just another small thing in a very big world. With electricity, you have power lines, so a lot of the wealthier middle class and upper class districts and cities have power lines stretching up the roads. It's basically what everyone has today, minus some of the more contemporary gadgets on the poles and wires. The poorer residents have to buy the fuel themselves, whether they're using dust, steam, or coal, lower-end households are equipped with furnaces or engines that convert them into energy. Sometimes there's a mix of both furnaces and power lines in neighborhoods, but not everyone can afford a monthly check to the local power supplier. Likewise, some households especially in rural areas, have zero power whatsoever. They rely purely on things like firewood and charcoal to warm their homes with the occasional candle. We'll only be talking about the most important resources, so let's talk lumber. To understand lumber, let's take a quick look at the plains of Marathon again. To the south is a small desert in the Baradina San Kingdom, and to the north are the Great Valleys, which are essentially fjords with big rivers and steep cliffs, just like our world. In between these two climates, forests littered the grasslands. Obviously, the densest forests are farther from city centers, but generally speaking, this temperate region between Baradina San and the Great Valleys makes for great lumber cultivation. The main exporters are trade companies, corporations, and or armies in service to the government. Where that lumber goes depends. If the government calls for a large shipment of wood, it would most likely bypass the supplier. If it doesn't, but the wood goes to the government anyway, then that supplier is probably in service to the government already. In the case of Mistral, the resources it collects are almost always done by federal parties, never capitalist ventures like trade companies. But hopefully you get the idea. The process gets expedited the more governments are involved. If ordinary people and tradesmen are just 
buying wood, like carpenters and toy makers, then they would most likely buy from the supplier, who may or may not function on behalf of the country. This may seem like an obvious process, and it is, especially since it's universal for most every resource in Terria, but it's important we understand how the economy works in such a diverse market. Something I never understood in Ruby Former is what money meant. It was a signifier of social class and power, but that was basically it. So please pardon me for being a little specific. I just want there to be more happening in the background than four people walking down a road and talking about things they're going to do. Metals work in the exact same way. Miners, contracted by private or public means, excavate iron, copper, silver, gold, coal, salt, and of course, dust. Because Grimm liked to hide in the shadows and crews refuse to mine in dark-lit places, veins are usually cut up in wide trenches or massive open pits. Again, Calabria is known for having a particularly strong mining market. Their northern mountains and burrows are littered with gaping craters and long stretches of cut-up dirt. Even some of their towns live in these pits. They're called crater towns because fuck you! Next to dust, lumber, and metals is agriculture, because we don't want people starving. It's basically just farms as we knew them at the turn of the 20th century, just with varying degrees of advanced automation. These machines depend on the wealth of their owner, of course, and almost all of them rely on some kind of convenient and portable power source. Case in point, dust plays a big part in farm automation. Agriculture includes crops and livestock, which are pretty much identical to the kinds you would find being made on Earth today. I mean, come on, it's not Ruby without cookies. And if you need cookies, you need dairy, eggs, sugar, etc. And I'm just going to pretend that since it's a supercontinent, that the land is large enough and diverse enough to cultivate all the New World commodities alike, like cocoa and corn. Just like lumber, if it's being supplied directly to the government, the system is expedited. These resources, among others, are sent to city centers, trade hubs, and or factories, and refined into more applicable resources like firewood, clothing, guns, pastries, toys, statues, etc. Again, there's not a lot to describe that we don't already know. There's plenty of new, fantastical machines and devices used to refine these resources, but I think going into that kind of detail is a waste of time. The gist is that the process is not so different. The contractors and the funding may vary with suppliers and buyers, but it's not too far removed from our world. There's just no global stock market or trading center. Lastly, even if it doesn't belong here, I'd like to talk about transportation. Thanks to the advent of affordable power through combustion engines, there's a great variety of vehicles at the people's disposal. The most common use of travel is by train. No one's really figured out cars yet, but they have repurposed old imperial ships like blimps and aircraft. There's also carriages, boats of all sizes, horses, good old-fashioned bicycles, but but no cars. I don't know why. Cars are just very anti-fantasy to me. Or maybe that was the point when you see cars in Fumble Alchemist because it was a time when they were less about fantasy and more about... Ah, oh, fuck it. I am the king of England, no sir! You are the patient! I've already gone to detail a bit on what the post-imperial age is and why dust is at least a little important, so this section will be more about the countries as they are and what they mean. Torinth began as a contiguous confederation of city-states and minor nations, not unlike Boro or the Free Banks. It wasn't until the last century that the ambitious proto-state of Torinth began swallowing its neighbors whole with its professional disciplined army and its effective use of industrialization and militarization. It's become something of a threat to the surrounding countries and a force to be reckoned with. Its military is probably the greatest in the world and the region's never known a better time in its history, and yet the other nations conspire to see its downfall. Sound familiar? Beyond anyone's interest is the southern Imeret kingdom of Baradin Hassan. Imerets are ancient orders of knights that elect an inquisitor to lead them as opposed to a monarch or a representative, hence their policies reflect that of their beliefs. They are the only human kingdom that fights on the frontier without the exclusive aid of hunters, and oddly enough, they are also older than the hunters themselves. No one really cares about them though because sand sucks. The Boro principalities are not entirely united as they are prone to alliances. They're not as developed as the Free Banks, and they're not as powerful as them either, so smaller parts like Aurora are practically helpless if the principalities, alongside any other allies, refuse to join their cause. But the reason why no one has bothered uniting this region is because the land itself is surprisingly hard to take. Boro is a mountain range with very few passes that only skilled messengers know. It nearly took Torrent's entire army just to make it to the capital of Aurora. If the city had held out for just a few more months, they would have single-handedly beaten the strongest nation in Marathon. Kelbrir is mining country. It's much more well known for it anyway. The resource-heavy mountains that line its northern border are a rich source of gold, silver, and many other compounds like dust and salt. I've already mentioned its crater towns and its dotted ranges, but perhaps more interestingly, Kelbrir is the only democracy in Terria. <laughs> It happened because they had a certain dynasty on the throne for nearly a thousand years and suddenly the last member died out. So they were just like, 
Fuck, we should elect someone. And that's basically how representative democracy started in Remnant. They even have fun as senators. Politically, however, they are a very passive country and almost never interfere in the affairs of the southern folk. If another nation tries to attack them, they can just hide in the mountains until the invading armies starve in the barren hills. Atlas is the absolutist monarch state with a rigid ruling class of nobles and kings and a lower class of peasants and plebiscites. It is by far the most traditional monarchic kingdom in all of Marathon and attests to the purity of a royal bloodline. Absurd amounts of money are used to construct palaces and build armies and almost none of it goes to the peasantry. Somehow it's not broke as fuck. They also have state-funded expeditions into the frontier and establish the lighthouse system that spans nearly half of the Dark West. So if a particularly dangerous Grimm is approaching the defense line, they can know within minutes. Think pre-revolutionary France before Russia went and ruined all of it. Speaking of Russia, Mistral was once a kingdom like the others, but then literally Lenin and now communism or at least some lesser form of it. People aren't starving. The People's Republic exists somewhat at odds with Torrent. It's the largest nation at Torrent's border and, for a time, was the only power in that region. Now with their superiority in question, tensions are rising between the two, despite signing a non-aggression pact. So basically, Germany and the Soviets. You know, I should probably stop making historical comparisons. Anyway, moving on to Istanbul. I mean Venice. I mean the Hanseatic lead. I mean Northern Italy. I mean the Free Banks. The Free Banks. The Free Banks the richer, more developed, younger brother of Boro. Their success is in their land. The cities line up against the deltas of the great river Seros, which read from the Boro Mountains into the sea. This location gives the Free Banks a geographical advantage. The river's fingers, so to speak, act as a natural barrier against invading armies, and the rich soil makes for great agricultural products. That, and its central location on the eastern shore, makes it the wealthiest and most developed region in all of Marathon. In fact, its overall population just barely exceeds that of Mistral, which geographically is three times the bank's collective size. And Gylus is Britain. Okay, okay, let me explain. Gylus' monarch is ceremonial, we went over this, but much like Britain's monarchy today, there are certain legislative and absolutist powers that the monarch can reserve, such as temporarily disbanding Congress, uh, and that's it. Basically. I wanted there to be some kind of industrial Britain analog to balance out literally France, so yeah, there you go. I don't think their societies are that much different though. And there's a rigid ruling class and a peasantry and an emerging middle class, but all that's really different is how power is concentrated. The Minister of Guileless probably has more direct control than the monarch. For the record, there are other smaller countries and communities that litter Marathon, but none of them are really that important. The only one I'd say that deserves a mention is the Shire Rizimbol Oakvale Portia analog, Hensmere. It's a tiny rural county that lives in a particularly fertile area of the Golden Delta, just outside the Free Banks. They're a discontiguous vassal of Gylus and provide a lot of crops and livestock in addition to a small monetary tribute. It's peaceful, and the air is fairer here. I bring this random country up because this is where Summer Rose and her children are from. <coughs> This is probably the part of the video you care about the most, unless you're me, in which case who gives a shit? I'm not inclined to outright remove characters from movie former because deep down I think they really are good places to start at. It's extremely difficult to forget their designs more so than their actual fucking names and I think that's a wonderful start. I can't say I agree with where they went in Ruby former, but at least I remember their faces. So we'll keep those at least. Ruby Rose is a young, energetic, and unbalanced new member of the Church of Beacon. Her mother, Summer Rose, was one of the founding members of the Order, and her half-sister, Yang Xiao Long, is among the strongest fighters. Needless to say, she has big shoes to fill. Ever since Summer Rose died, Yang's stepmother, her father Tai Yang... Tai Yang? Tai Yang has treated her with much more affection and care than Yang, leading to a very distant relationship between Yang and her younger sister, which isn't to say Ruby pities her. In fact, Yang has become more of a role model in her eyes than her own mother, but Yang just isn't returning that. They live in Hensmere, a small rural vassal of Gylus in the outskirts of the Free Banks. When Ruby graduates from Signal Academy, which is pretty much just Signal from Ruby former except not on an island, she applies for the Church of Beacon and gets in on a legacy, a referral, and an adequate combat proficiency score. She's already part of their religion religion, so it's fine. Yang enters Beacon sometime before Ruby, presumably two or three years prior, with virtually the same credentials and a higher combat proficiency grade. Yang once saw Ruby as the friend she never had. In grade school, she seldom talked or socialized with anyone, choosing to train more often than play. Her stepmother, Summer Rose, was her idol, and Ruby was her sparring partner. When Summer died and Tai Yang began coddling Ruby something awful, Yang distanced herself from who she saw as the star of their family. A constant reminder that Ruby, not Yang, was the favorite child, and that the marriage that 
brought Yang into this world was a long-forgotten mistake. Even after earning her way into the church her stepmother built, she views Ruby with contempt and tries to outdo her at every given opportunity. My intent is for there to be more sibling drama between these two, and a one-sided rivalry seems to work okay for now. I don't think two failed marriages would sit that well with the firstborn, especially since the first union ended in abandonment. I think she would obsess over the thought that she was the reason it didn't work out, that Taiying neglected her because she caused that marriage to fall apart, pushing her to outdo his favorite child in every aspect in a desperate bid to show her worth, while also holding incredible contempt for him as a father. It might be cliche, but isn't that so much more interesting than just playful and short-tempered? Oh, and also I'm getting rid of the eye thing because that's fucking retarded. Oh, her eyes get red when she's angry! This is a conversation that happened. Remember that scene in the Boo Saga when Videl is just getting pulverized in the arena? I can imagine a huge turning point in both Ruby and Yang's characters being a sparring match that goes horribly wrong. Ruby is treating it as a practice fight and a way to show off to Yang, and Yang is using the match to destroy her. It could get to the point where Tai Yang runs into the arena from the bleachers because it's some kind of open house night, and the battle has to be suspended because Ruby's bones are getting broken and she's screaming and in tears and has to be hospitalized. I know that's a bit of an extreme image, but I think if Yang sees how violent and internalized her feelings toward her family are, she could potentially seek to reconcile with Ruby and maybe even come to terms with who she is. All the while, Ruby's world would completely change. The role model she so religiously looked up to tried to murder her and humiliated her in front of everyone. This would be a really grown-up moment for her, when she realizes she can't be a naive kid anymore. If Yang could do that to her, imagine what the Grim would do. Perhaps she would even hold contempt for Yang, but also a profound respect for showing her up. What I'm saying is it wouldn't be the same relationship from that point. In some ways, the tables would be turned. Also, this idea is completely off script, and I just thought of it, but after the fight, Ruby would probably try and do a lot of grown-up things, like, uh, you know, kissing people, trying to have relationships with older men, proving to herself that she's an adult and not a kid anymore, you know, Asuka stuff. I just thought that'd be so interesting for her character, for her to just go from this really naive kid to someone that's desperate to be an adult. Eh, it's a, it's a half-baked idea, I don't know. Let's move on to another main character, Blake. <laughs> The general gist is she's not very outgoing, but she's also pretty cunning. She knows what moves to make, but also has a hard time making them. Like Yang, she doesn't socialize that much and keeps to her own hobbies, like reading and drawing. I wouldn't go as far as to say she's awkward, but I would say she doesn't like people, but not for the reason you think. Blake's father, Gira, was a radio correspondent under the Lord Protector of Aurora. When Torrenth invaded, he announced some of the Aurorian government's final words of resistance over the radio before fleeing the city altogether with Blake and Kali. Kali? Kali? Kali. It's Kali. Like cauliflower. Cauliflower! When the time came to find a new life in Torrent, they realized that they would have to go back to school or enlist to become a citizen, since an Aurorian education was invalidated after the invasion. In the case of families, I promise this isn't a long tangent, the state follows a rule known as majority citizenship, where only a supermajority of the family has to be a citizen in order for the others to count as well. So Blake surmises that her mother Callie should go to school, Gear should get a job, and Blake should enlist as a hunter. That way, they can get majority citizenship without going broke. Her family's reluctant to agree, obviously, but they realize she's the only one who can enlist as a hunter, and is far too young and inexperienced to get a job without citizenship. Her parents, on the other hand, can get jobs with their experience, but are far too old to enlist as hunters. For obvious reasons, people over the age of 30 can't apply for that kind of physical education. Since enlisting into the de facto Torian military is ideologically out of the question, this really was the only alternative. Callie has some reservations about it, but eventually she agrees to it. Oof, sorry. That was a long paragraph. Basically, Blake is doing this for her family. That's her motivation, to not get kicked out. Which wouldn't seem that hard if she wasn't also a faunus in disguise! Yeah, I actually liked that point of her character, but it really should be one of the first things we learn. The reason why she didn't just apply for another school is because Beacon has very low standards for applicants. If you convert to the faith, or if you're already part of the faith, you're basically in. 
Blake didn't have the kind of education that Yang and Ruby had at Signal, so she's pretty much confined to this one society. Also, I probably should have mentioned this before, but the reason why I call them societies more often than not is because I want a line where Team Ruby is talking with some random citizens and they tell them we live in a society. This is a serious video. Blake's parents don't know she's a Faunus, and she's afraid of telling them because they could disown her. It's not uncommon for Faunus children to just be abandoned by their human parents. Oh, and also her parents are humans, straight up. Being a Faunus isn't always genetic, it can also be random, so Blake's just unlucky, I guess. For that reason, she almost always keeps her hair long and wears that bow on her head. When people see she doesn't have any regular ears, they just assume she's deaf. And because her bow has special weights that keep her ears hidden, this isn't far from wrong. So there you go, that's why Blake isn't very social. Because she can't hear people! So let's talk about Weiss now. Surprisingly, I'm not 100% sure what I want out of her. I think generally she's very detached from her family and the world around her, she's much more aware of her wealth, but I wouldn't say she acts her wealth, if that makes any sense. She's not a prissy bitch, and she's much more open to talking with people from the lower middle class than she is with people from her own. In a way, her heritage, her wealth, and her prestige are treated more like a curse than a benefit in her mind, and I think she would spite her father for treating her more like an asset than a daughter. Which sounds familiar, I know, but she doesn't lash out at the ruling class for being uptight and stuff. She's just more reserved around them. Maybe she can sneak away at night and join the townsfolk at the inn under a different alias, maybe get some singing in there to establish she's good at that, I don't know. Out of all the main characters, I think I have the least on my mind for her, she just sort of bounces off everyone else. Her family is the largest donor to the Church of Beacon, so much so that they take up residence there, but that's basically it. There's an original character I had in mind that's analogous to Captain Blaskowitz, a torn lieutenant that grieves for the world, who would step into Weiss's life and give her a bit of a direction in becoming a hunter, but I don't have anything past that. I guess her brother died in service to Beacon as a hunter and her and the lieutenant meet at his funeral, but yeah, I don't have anything else. It's not like any single moment changed her life, it's just how she is. Gripping, isn't it? Oh yeah, there are other characters, aren't there? This video is long enough, so I'll just give brief descriptions for everyone else. Unlike Ruby Former, my intent was to make Ruby the actual protagonist, so these guys are just flavorings. Just like in Ruby Former, Jean is the youngest child of eight, all of which are sisters. Because Jean comes from a long line of great generals and kings, and because women can't enlist in the Torian military, Jean is left with continuing the family legacy of honor and loyalty to the state. So a lot is riding on him. He's not a fraud, he's just afraid of upsetting his father, who is a strict traditionalist. As such, he loves to feign a royal status. So he's, like, the opposite of Weiss. Pyra, I think, is probably the most interesting character I have lined up for all the wrong reasons. There's a very dramatic movement going on in Atlas that involves the mass removal and, um... Extermination? Of Faunus? With disturbing similarities to Zivema Viplapik, and, uh, the head of that movement is her father. So, that's weighing on her conscience. She doesn't know whether or not to embrace her father's ideals, but either way, she's famous because of them. Blake avoids her religiously. Nora and Lee Ren are spies. They were sent by the Inquisitor of Baradina San with false papers to investigate the religious doctrine of this relatively new church with low entry requirements. Nora was taken in as an orphan and befriended Ren, who had been a member of the Imeret since he was a kid. While he's very cold and calculating, lacking a lot of emotion or interest in material things, Nora is the complete opposite, appearing very sociable and lively, and doing very well in crowds. Their purpose is to highlight the action and the comedy of the series, while also creating political and religious intrigue. Aside from that, I don't have much from them either. They're basically just the comedy and the action. I did think about making Jean the main character, like I discussed in my review of Volume 1, but I think the only reason why that was is because I was thinking of terms of how Ruby Former handled all their characters. So in that context, him being the main character would have fit more. In this context, I think Ruby deserves it better. There's a lot more there for her now than before, at least I like to think so, and although I'd like to explore Jean a bit more in the future, I don't think that'd be a good use of our time. So let's talk about the characters I didn't add. <laughs> Maybe Coco. M maybe, maybe she can stay. I was born a woman, boss. If I'm being honest, I can live without a lot of the side characters in Ruby Former. They're not as important, I think, to a reconstruction. Their exclusion would probably help in the long run too, since one of Ruby Former's biggest faults is having lost focus on who's more important than what. Basically, doesn't matter. You can have like everyone's families in there, but. Uh, I, I think this is more of an opportunity to have better characters than whatever the fuck Volume 4 through 6 did.
So you might be wondering why I went to all of this effort to try and rebuild Ruby. Well, it's because I hate Ruby, and I think it's terrible, and I think the way they've made it is even worse, if that makes any sense at all. I think within Ruby Former, there is some kind of story that can be told that is much better than what really is being told. Somewhere in there is an idea worth these characters and these designs. Somewhere in there is a series that people will like for more than just vapid reasons. Somewhere in there is a Ruby worth telling, as is I can't really say it is worth telling. And I can't say this one is just objectively better, but like I said, at least it's not Ruby former. Jesus Christ, that was a long video. Alright, uh, thanks for watching. This is off script, by the way, so I, I'm just shooting out here. Um, why'd I do this? Well, yeah, I already explained that. Bye! See you next year.